This is the Pioneer Television Station of Northeastern Pennsylvania, WBRE TV, Channel 28 in Wilkes Barre. New Year's Day, 1953, and college football bowl games permeated that first day's programming. Within a year, WBRE TV was televising in color, thanks to its affiliation with the NBC television network. Finding programming was a primary concern those early days. Former station owner David Baltimore reflected on that very subject several years ago. The network started out only for a few hours a day originally and expanded hour by hour into the afternoon and then into the morning. And as they did, they left us periods where we had a program and we looked for what we could find. Some of the local programs those early years included Roscoe the Clown in the 1950s and Kitchen Magic in the 1960s. Meanwhile, WBRE-TV's reputation for local news coverage grew with such talent as anchorman Franklin D. Coslett and weatherman Joe Scott. By 1965, the two-story mansion that had been home to WBRE-TV operations was converted into a three-story facility to accommodate the growing advances in the television industry. In 1972, this same downtown Wilkesbury building would sustain the wrath of Hurricane Agnes, but despite the floodwaters, WBRE-TV remained on the air. Mother Nature would deal yet another blow in January 1989 when an ice storm knocked down WBRE-TV's transmitter tower. But it would be replaced, and today WBRE-TV uses a 3.2 million watt transmitter compared to 1,000 water that first year. And satellite technology enables WBRE-TV to bring breaking news events to more than 2 million viewers. Yes, it was 40 years ago WBRE launched into the television business, and although the faces may have changed through the years, the rich television tradition continues. If there's one thing everyone learned who lived through Agnes, it's respect. Respect for people who fought back, and respect for this river, which on any given day could change our lives again. Rich Noon and I witness news on the banks of the Susquehanna. And now to the present today, 15 years to the date after Agnes, the last empty space on Public Square in Wilkesbury is dedicated. Andy Mahalshik is there with a live eye to tell us about a new home for First Eastern Bank. Andy? That's right, Vic. Of course, uh, despite today's nasty weather... The heart. Sorry we couldn't have better weather for you. ...on Public Square. Also at today's ceremony was Frank Carlucci, a native who was President Nixon's assistant during the flood. Carlucci was crucial in securing the millions of dollars in flood aid. These days, Carlucci is President Reagan's national security advisor. And while Agnes was on his mind, so were other issues. Andy Mahalshik spoke with Carlucci about some of them. Andy? Well, Vic, it would be indeed naive to think that a man with Frank Carlucci's power and prestige around the world could possibly escape the inevitable questions. Questions whose answers, of course, affect all of us in one way or another in northeastern and central Pennsylvania. Carlucci had just completed the dedication ceremonies on the square. He then took several steps across the street and met with the local media. Korea, the Persian Gulf, and the Iran-Contra affair grabbed the spotlight. Made it is indeed the local press didn't an waste any time in cornering one of President Reagan's top foreign policy advisors about the state of world affairs. Should America protect Kuwaiti or... ...reports this latest step may produce some new leads. The manhunt for the killer of little nine-year-old Renee Waddle is intensifying. The girl's beaten and burned body was found late Sunday night in an isolated wooded area of Roaring Brook Township. Up to now, the police have come up empty-handed. That may soon change. Tomorrow morning, police will conduct a massive search of the wooded area where Renee Waddell's burned body was found. They're looking for evidence in that case, but reliable sources also tell me they're looking for clues in at least three other cases from the city of Scranton, including the murder of a Scranton co-ed. Today, the Lackawanna County District Attorney obtained Scranton police files on the three unsolved crimes. The 1987 murder of Lorene Finn. The 19-year-old was beaten to death and her body also set on fire. Investigators are also looking at the disappearance of 11-year-old Jolene Lakey in 1986. She lived in the same neighborhood as Waddell and the 1978 disappearance of Joanne Williams. The recent publicity on the issue that, uh, you know, these uh, incidences were connected. Um, that's not to say they are. I just wanted these files uh, to review them for myself to see if there are any similarities. The Waddle murder may just be the catalyst to solving these other mysteries. Andy Bahalshik, Eyewitness News, Scranton. A judge. It became clear that there were a few. And three members of their entourage were thrown from their seats. Gloria was asleep at the time. 
Ron Jones is Gloria's bus driver. Where was the group going and what what happened? Where what exactly happened on the interstate? Uh, we were stopped for a truck accident and a truck hit us from behind. Didn't see us or I don't know. Hit us pretty good, so. What was Gloria's reaction afterwards? Did everyone realize they were okay or was it what was the scene on the bus? Uh, well, it was dark, all the light knocked all the lights out, so you really couldn't see, you know, we were just Knocked all the windows out and everything, so we, it was just pretty hectic. But her band, the Miami Sound Machine, was already in Syracuse at the time. The band's already there. They left yesterday. Where did you just come from? New York City. She was at CBS Records. We had a meeting there last night, and we were just headed up to do the show tonight. All six patients were brought to Scranton CMC. While the five others suffered only minor injuries, Gloria broke what's called the first lumbar vertebrae in her back. A broken back, you know, that involves one of the bones in the back. She has right. broken one of those, yes, in that sense it's a broken back. But she is not paralyzed in any way, shape or form, no. Meanwhile, outside the hospital, these two young girls walked several miles in the cold and snow to be near their idol. Why are you standing outside this hospital tonight? Well, because I'm a real big fan of Gloria, and I just think she's really cool. I thought that she wasn't going to do her concert, that her back was like, was like she wouldn't be able to stand or anything and sing or stuff, like, like she was going to have her concert. What would you tell her if you can give her a message? That I hope she gets well. And now, there were five other people on her private tour bus. Here is a list of their names and their conditions as of 11 o'clock this evening. Of course, Gloria Estefan, stable condition. Emilio Estefan, her husband and manager, treated and released. Naib, their nine-year-old son, treated and released. Lori Rooney, the school teacher for their son, treated and released. Barbara Arson Siblia, a wardrobe assistant, she's in stable condition also with a back injury, and Ron Jones, the driver, treated and released. Now the doctors, Brian, tell me they will call a news conference for tomorrow morning to update us on Gloria Estefan's condition and to let us know what their next step will be. One thing is for certain, though, it will be some time before Gloria Estefan can once ago go back on the stage. Reporting with the Live Eye in Scranton, I'm Andy Bahalshik. Okay, Andy, thank you for your extensive work tonight. It is the most ambitious and we'll have more of what significance how important was central pennsylvania to senator hines in your experience very important he's very instrumental in many of our economic development programs mr loading thank you very much to my right now is uh, henry fry like coming county commissioner mr i'm in front of scranton uh, city hall where move aimed at erasing the red ink basically <laughs> think it's just some young kids in that uh, living in that area we, uh, we believe that it it's somebody that's familiar with that area. Now all four fires were set on or near the 600 blocks of the streets involved. Now they're saying young kids involved. The fire chief says basically because the way the fires were set and where they were set would lend themselves to the theory that possibly young kids would jump fences or hedge, hedges and get to these locations in a rather quickened pace. The first three fires were within a half an hour. So that's the way they're looking right now. Reporting live with the Eyewitness News in Dunmore, I'm Andy Mahalshik. Thank you very much, Andy. Reporting from Dunmore, we'll have more on that story as it develops. A Luzerne County man was... Sometimes it seems all it takes is one shot. News 22 networker Tony Ingargiola picked a good time to pick up his camcorder. He captured the final fatal blow to the old Scranton State Hospital. The demolition began earlier this month and this evening it ended. Workers now have to clean up the rubble. They're making way for a new veteran's home. If you can't get supplies... Thank you to the doctors and nurses who took care of her and her family after a terrible bus crash last year. On March 20th, 1990, her tour bus was rear-ended by a tractor-trailer in the snow-covered Pocono Mountains. The singer suffered a broken vertebrae in her back and was taken to Scranton's Community Medical Center. Her husband, Emilio, and 10-year-old son, Naive, suffered only minor injuries. They stayed at the Ronald McDonald House while Gloria was stabilized. They took care of my son so well. They really, not only my son, but my husband, who at that point was traumatized. And it really took a lot, a load off my mind to know that he was well taken care of and him in a very warm environment. And they brought us here, at least it felt like home. It's nothing that you felt like, you know, you went to a, ho to a hotel with nobody there. And uh, including from the paramedics all the way to the doctors and everybody was extremely nice. 
As Stefan says, that peace of mind helped her get her career back on track. But through my whole recovery, the main thing that helped me through was concentrating on uh, mental well-being and my emotional well-being, which my family took good care of. After donating $5,000 to the house, Estefan made her way through a mob of fans outside. This usually quiet neighborhood turned into one filled with paparazzi as word of her visit spread. I became a fan. She was, as soon as she had her accident here, I sort of came in to see what she was about. I was excited. My mom wanted me to go get her autograph, and I said, okay. Estefan is as good as new, back on the road and back on the charts. In fact, her latest hit, Coming Out of the Dark, was inspired by that bus crash. And she says her life was also inspired by what happened inside this house. Andy Bahalshik, Eyewitness News, Scranton. What was the reason for the lapse of time between 1982 and 1986 before you were involved? Um, the people... This actress Jill Eikenberry, she seems to follow you around from place to place. I can't get rid of her. Uh, one might also uh, only suspect that there might be a relationship here. <laughs> uh, well, I don't want to tell tales out of school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jill, Jill got involved in this movie. It was actually a good story. Uh, it's a very small part that she plays in the movie. And uh, it's not, not something that she would ordinarily do, but she got very involved. ...indicate that the best form of management is a non-management. Could you explain? Yes. Uh, what do you think will stand out in the minds of consumers who purchased the book? Well, I think the uh, nice thing about it is that... What might Americans learn from the plan that has been incorporated in Denmark? Well, you might learn that um, if you... If you look back on that time frame where the daughter was missing, were there any serious doubts that she ever think she was going to see her daughter again? Um, I think when you're going through a situation like that, uh... Don't forget to watch uh, Laugh-In tomorrow night. <laughs> it's not on tomorrow night. Finally canceled it, huh? I told you they couldn't keep it up every week. <laughs> you heard it here first! No, here! Back there! You heard it here first! Oh. Working with Dan Rowan through the years, Dick, uh, what did you learn about him? What did he learn about you? And what did we learn about both of you? How's that for a deep question? <laughs> well, that, it was a marvelous relationship that started back in the early 50s. This was the one you would do with Artie Johnson, the little old lady. Did you uh, have somebody in mind when you did that, or did that just come out of the blue? Uh, no, that character I brought to the show, I had done um, Agnes Scooch and Auntie Mame and had got a great response because that's exactly how I talked and that was how I dressed and I just held on to the things. Uh, but then when I got on the show... To the, the battle of the sexes here a little bit, uh, <laughs> who has the harder crisis uh, within the context of the movie, your character or that of John Ritter's? Well, John Ritter is just... Um... Play with yeah, definitely, that sounds better. <laughs> There was some belief that Tyson attempted suicide by uh, being involved in a, in a one-car crash. There was also uh, problems that uh, Tyson had in terms of fights outside the ring. And then, of course, the incident uh, at the Miss Black America pageant. What happened in, in those final months uh, in Tyson's career? Well, I think that Customato died before Mike Tyson was the heavyweight champion in, of the world. And to relate to any of the, the darkness, the, the demons of the character uh, in what you did. Oh, I think we all have our dark sides, um, but I spent some time out at a drug rehab and... Good afternoon, I'm Mark Hiller. A water main break at the school is causing big problems this noon. Pennsylvania Midday's Carrie Shan is live outside Bishop Hoban. Carrie, what's the latest there? Bishop Hoban High School, you can see over to the side here that the crews are working right now. Earlier this morning, they were having some trouble. For now, we're alive in Wilkes-Barre, Carrie Shea in Pennsylvania Midday. Mark? All right, Carrie, boy, what a mess there. But as Pennsylvania Midday's Joe Holden found out, some people aren't phased by the cold and actually like it. There's no fooling around in the cold when you have a hot pizza pie to deliver. I enjoy winter. For Pennsylvania Midday, I'm Joe Holden. The search is on for a bank robber. I'm sorry, where are we going to next? All right, we do have that update now on a court ruling concerning accused Luzerne County double murderer Hugo Solensky. A state court steps in and reverses a lower court decision that Solensky would not stand trial for a Luzerne County jailbreak. Pennsylvania Midday's Amy Bradley is live in Wilkesbury with that court ruling. Good afternoon, Amy. 
Good afternoon, Mark. Well, Hugo Solinsky may have slid his way out of jail, but he will not get away without facing criminal charges. For now, reporting live in Wilkes-Barre, Amy Bradley, Pennsylvania Midday. Mark? Amy, thank you. The search is on for a bank robber one day after a holdup in Wilkes-Barre. It happened Monday morning around 10:15 at M&T Bank on Kidder Street. Witnesses say a man was wearing a hat, white scarf, and sunglasses, and had on a windbreaker that was green on top and black on the bottom. He never showed a weapon, but handed the teller a note claiming he had a gun. Witnesses say the holdup happened quickly and quietly. Anyone with information on this robbery is asked to call Wilkesbury Police at the number on your screen, 826-8106. A certified nurse's assistant charged with sexually assaulting an elderly nursing home resident is free on bail this midday. 27-year-old David Gula of Exeter posted $50,000 cash bail Monday and faces a hearing next week. Police say Gula sexually assaulted a 90-year-old Alzheimer's patient at Kingston Commons early Sunday morning and that a co-worker caught him in the act. The nursing home administrator told us that uh, they are cooperating with Kingston Police and that the care and security of all of the facility's patients is and always will be a priority. A female astronaut is in trouble with the law, charged with attacking her rival in what's described as a love triangle involving another astronaut. The charges the defendant faces coming up on Pennsylvania Midday. And later, no hibernating for a man and his horses, how they cope in this bitterly cold weather.